Hey, welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. It's a good day today. Let's just have a good day. Why not? This is going to be Marchand versus Fisher in a really cool English opening. Fisher is the black. C4 immediately. Fisher will do the knight f6. Knight f3. G6, he's going to fianchetto his bishop. B3, his opponent is going to fianchetto his bishop. And, of course, he fianchettos. And, of course, he fianchettos. So they've got bishops opposing each other. And Fisher's going to get the castling done right now. And now, his opponent wants to fianchetto both of his bishops. Nothing wrong with this. Fisher's going to bump toward the center. He does fianchetto the bishop. Whenever you, uh, if you decide to move either the g-pawn up or the b-pawn up, you really are indicating you're going to fianchetto, and you really do need to fianchetto, uh, just as an awareness. I played a few games where I did not fianchetto, and I paid the price, baby. Not a good idea. So now Fisher's going to come to the center. And this is classic Bobby. Now, of course, Nobody's going to let the center go on a post, so there's some tension here. Whether they get rid of the tension immediately or not is irrelevant, but Fisher bumps again. So he's not going to exchange. He could, but that's not the rule that you have to. Fisher instead tries something a little interesting here. His knight's going to come to D2, and now Fisher's going to push the Rook over to develop the rook from the castling. His center, white, is going to secure it, which is always a good move. And now Bobby is going to gently bring a pawn forward. Remember, once you move a pawn forward, it's not going back. And actually, it was uh, one of the chess masters, one of the grandmasters, uh, wanted to change the rule to where pawns could move back and forth. That would really change chess, wouldn't it? I think it was Bronstein, in fact, David Bronstein, that argued maybe we ought to change that rule because that could really interest. That would make the game of chess astonishing, wouldn't it? Wow. Or maybe make a rule or two, depending on the pawn structure, you could move a pawn backward and forward. That might be kind of interesting, you know. I'd like to see if that can be pulled off. And now Bishop's going to come to F5, supporting his central pawn. He is going to bump up the H a little bit now. And you're saying, well, now, and then look at this. So Fisher has castled, and yet he's pushing his pawns forward. There's nothing really threatening to come and attack the king. He is well tucked in. And the pawns could potentially become battering rams in an attack mode, if that's what this ends up to be. On the other hand, it does gain space, but it does weaken the kingside castle position. But notice that white has also weakened his kingside castle position. Now, and I know there's a discussion back and forth. Is this a weakening or is it an advancement to maintain control of squares? See, the white controls this one and this one and this one. And so there's there's always questions back and forth. I suppose it depends how you play the game. The queen's going to come to C2, and now Fisher is coming into the center. Again, he's going to build a little pressure. He's also going to gain a little bit more central space. His opponent closes the center. You have an option to either, what that would do is if you exchange pawns, like so, you open up the C file, right, for your rooks, if you're going to exchange a pawn. Apparently, neither side thought that would be viable. He's not going to give Fisher the chance to make it viable. He's going to push the C5. Now, Fisher does a really interesting thing here with this knight. I want you to keep your eye on this knight. That's quite a quite a trip he takes. Again, he's, he's squaring up the pawns, preventing the knight 
That's a good preventative move. The knight can come to here next, tickling the queen if he wants. Instead, he prevents the knight from coming any further. In case, that's what Fisher's trying to do, if he's trying to get queenside play. Bumping the pawn can prevent that. That takes that square away from that knight. You always want to keep your eye open for things like that. Fisher's going to dodge his knight back over to here. There's going to be a rearrangement of knights all over the place. And now notice where Fisher's knight ends up. Had he come to here with the knight, he couldn't have been here and influencing these squares. Or this one. Or this one. So this square is more influenced with that particular arrangement. Not that that's the final goal of the knight. I'm just pointing that out to you. He's made one, two, three moves to get his knight over here. And yet, again, it is toward the king side. It's still radiating a central influence. That's a pretty good setup. But nothing is open in a closed board. That means the pawns are locked. You want to take the time to rearrange your pieces. More than often than not, it is the knights that make a journey in a closed board position. Nothing's going to come through the center. No rooks are coming through. No bishops are coming through. No queens are coming through. So you have the time to rearrange where your knights are going to be. And that's why we saw Fisher make that knight journey. It's perfectly safe to do that in the opening before you fully develop all your pieces. And his opponent is doing the same thing with his knights. This is typical Grandmaster chess, right? So now, crazy enough... His opponent moves the rook rather than castling. So now he can't castle on that side, which is kind of silly in a way. And Fisher's going to attack the pawn chain. Now that the white can't castle that side, Fisher sees the theme of let's go ahead and open up that center. Because now he can attack the king and the king will be vulnerable in the center of the square, in, in the uh, center of the board, right? This is the principle of castling to tuck your king away during the beginning and middle phases of the game. So that's something to keep our eye on. Oh, you're not going to castle? Then I am going to open up the center. Otherwise, he could have comfortably left it closed, but now it's also comfortable to open it. So here we go. And his opponent bumps the B. You see why he did that. He bumps the B because in case Fisher goes here, then he'll simply take it there and it keeps the board closed. But the difference in the position, and this is so important to try to look ahead to understand this, is if he does continue his attack on the pawn chain, those two pawns disappear and you have an open B file for rooks and or queens. So that could be significant. In the meantime, the middle of the board stays closed, but now there's a highway going into either camp depending on who could try to control that open file. So you want to keep your eye on stuff like that just in case Fisher does do that. Now, you could, if he was to take this and then you retake, that's what the board would look like. There would be no open file, but the black pawns could make better progress in disrupting the white pawns. I think. Depends how you play your pawns. Maybe I better not speak with such certainty. So so this has a very interesting, uh, this is going to be very, very interesting with what we see. And now, Fisher comes up to A5. 
So they are both pushing the pawns to clash and try to open something up. In other words, what this is telling us, now you notice it went from uh, Fisher was moving his knights around, his opponent was rearranging his knights. Now they're both just starting to push pawns because now the question is, where on the board can we open this up so that we can get our rooks and bishops and queens involved? Now, right now, in a closed position, and closed means the pawns are locked, in that kind of position as a general rule, depending on how good you get at chess, it favors knights because knights need outposts, meaning there's a pawn supporting them. For instance, no, he would not do this, but I want to show this to illustrate it. That would be a good outpost because the pawn is supporting the knight. In fact, that would be a fantastic outpost because the pawns are past the point of chasing the knight away. You would be forced to exchange that knight. Okay, that's what I mean by an outpost. Somewhere where there is a pawn supporting the knight. That's an outpost. Okay, so simple basic stuff, but we'll see how this works. Now his bishop comes to b3, and Fisher goes ahead and takes the c5. He's going to go ahead and say, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's attack the pawn chain. And now we see the response, rather than here, like I said, he could have, he does respond from the B, and now we have an open B file for potential rook activity. Fisher is going to bring his knight back, and of course, now that move makes sense. It's the B file, so take control of it. In time, that can be your very helpful uh, positional uh, support, and look at that. A very good outpost. Now we can see that that stops the, the white rook influence from going all the way across the board, but that's not a permanent block. It's a great outpost, but it's not a permanent block because of the A pawn here. He can, if he wants to, chase that knight away, in which case Fisher would take the bishop. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't bump back. He wouldn't come back. He would go ahead and continue going forward and exchange a piece were that to happen. But that would also eliminate that knight outpost. So I'm just pointing that out to you. So rather than do that, queen will come to c1 instead, and queen will come to d7. And knight will come to b3. So you can see there the balance of power is starting to come on this side of the board for white. He's got, and notice why he's playing on that side. Now, this is another excellent Jeremy Silman idea. The reason he's playing on the queen side is because the arrows point that direction. The pawns, I mean. <laughs> The pawns are like an arrow pointing in this direction. So that's the side of the board you play on. Fisher's pawns are pointing that direction. So that's the side of the board Fisher wants to play on. And notice where the balance of power is on both sides. White's coming to this side and black's going to that side. That makes good sense because the position of the board tells you that. Kind of cool how that works. So knight b3 and queen. Knight goes to b3, and now queen will come to c7. And bishop will bump to d2. He doesn't want to exchange. Now, under, he doesn't want to exchange the minor piece, right? But the dark squared bishop is considered the bad bishop simply because he has nowhere to go except right here, right? And that's... <laughs> that's just not going to do anything for the white bishop. Not right now. That can entirely change in the game. So if he could, it wouldn't hurt him to exchange that bad bishop rather than keep it. We'll see. And now here comes Fisher. He's still marching forward. 
again, gaining more space. He acquires a target. He's going to try to make uh, White's position. Don't you get the impression that White's position is somewhat cramped? Fisher's going to increase that. He says, yes, let's, let's try to get this guy cramped. And sure enough, the worst possible square to put a knight is in the corner. However, if you do find yourself in this kind of a position, it's not the end of the world. Just don't leave him there for very long. You now know that whatever uh, plan the white had within the next few moves, not more than three at maximum, I would propose, you want to get that knight out of that corner because that is a dead horse. That is the worst place. Sometimes temporarily you have to do it. It's all good. Just don't forget about it. Chess is a team sport. We want all of the pieces working together to coordinate. There's going to be times when you have a bad position. It's all good. Don't, don't beat yourself up over it, but don't leave him there for five or six next moves. Uh-uh. No, sir. That's not good policy. And here comes Fisher, H4. Now he's using this H as a rocket, as a bullet to blow open the position of his opponent. But the crazy thing is he didn't castle. So it's still feasible to attack with a pawn. Now, the general rule is you don't want to just throw a pawn all the way down the board without some backup, either from other pawns. In this case, he doesn't. That pawn is on his own, right? He's, he's the lone guy out there. But he does have some pieces that are here. It's not directly influencing that pawn. But the queen is at least keeping her eye on this square here. Yes, it's guarded. We know that. But just so you know, you want some influence behind the pawn thrust. Maybe Fisher is just trying to change up the position. The advantage is it could give him that H open file. That might be interesting. And, and the issue is the king hasn't even castled yet. So who knows? But we do know now that white has the B, the B file. Maybe Fisher's trying to get something done over on that board. Who knows? We'll, we'll see. It, it is interesting, to say the least. And his opponent says, no, I do not want to exchange with you. And I don't want to flub up my pawn structure. Notice how he touches the bishop, which very much limits now, Bobby's white square bishop on that side of the board. He doesn't have very many good spots to go. Notice again, the closed position. This is a clutter board, as it were. Um, there's just so much in the middle that it's difficult to get your pieces coordinated on either side. That's the advantage of a closed board in some respects. The disadvantage is, uh-oh. The disadvantage is it doesn't leave you a chance to coordinate as well as you ought to or as you can. So let's see how this works. This is getting very interesting. White is going to bring his bishop back up to b4. And now Bobby bumps his knight to h7. So in a way, this end is closed, and we see the center completely closed. What's going on? Okay. I told you, don't leave that knight for too long, and he didn't. You can't. That's like playing a knight down. So here comes this other knight which is very commendable. You really must do that. See, there's no shame in having it down in that corner or any corner, but don't leave it there very long. I, I know I'm overemphasizing that, but that is really critical. He's going to try to get his queen into this. Now Bobby's going to rearrange, and why not? I mean, let's face it. 
it's obvious he's going to try to come either to here or here. Yes, because this is just a dead diagonal to him. This is granite. He's not going to have influence on that board. So that makes sense. So his opponent is rearranging his knight, which is very, very good. If your bishop is not valuable here, and you really can't open it up here. See, this is Bobby's bad bishop. And in fact, this bishop is positively horrible. But it doesn't make it useless, so try to improve it. It makes good sense why he's going to do this. now. And now here, this, this is just blitzoid. That's, that's silly. Uh, he moves his king. Okay, here comes Bobby. See, yeah, this makes sense. I just wanted to point that out. Over here, that bishop did nothing. And in a way, the bishop's in the way of the queen if the queen needs to go this way. The queen has a beautiful open diagonal, more or less. It's entirely useless for now. All those closed pawns are blocking every square the queen can land on. We get that. But that bishop was worthless. So why not put him behind the locked pawns, because they can't go backwards. There's a beautiful diagonal going through the king camp. So that makes sense to rearrange that bishop that way. I, I'm, I am making a big whoop to do about that on purpose. And now what he did is he artificially castled. You cannot leave your king in the center of the board throughout an entire course game if you can help it chances are the likelihood is much better that your opponent will attack hard, fierce, and furious, which is what Bukovic says in his book, to do if your opponent doesn't castle or can't. You just go total tilt toward him and attack, 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 attack. The artificial castle, it did get his king tucked away, but it took him a few extra moves, and that's not the best policy. Here comes Fisher. And you say, wait a minute, the knight went backward. This is the crazy thing about knights. <laughs> In the process of going backward, he can now come forward if he needs to. Now, of course, right now he's not going to. There's no way he's going to take that or go there. But putting himself in this position again, re-centralizing, gives him a chance to go forward. So you, you kind of go back, and then you really leap forward. It, it, it all it all works. And now... Here comes the rearrangement of the white squared bishop of Bobby's opponent because, like Bobby, this guy is hitting granite. So there's no re... At this juncture... See, when Bobby's bishop was here, it was the worst piece on the board. Now he's put it to where he can make exquisite use of it. It is the same principle here. That's the worst piece on the board. So why not rearrange it and get it going? This is what we're seeing here. Now, Bobby's going to bump his rook over, and Queen is going to come to Ewa. You know that, see, the feel is they can't really get a whole lot coordinated. They can't move a lot uh, space-wise. The long-range pieces are really cramped in a closed board. This, this is a fabulous illustrating game to show you this. That I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's the characteristic of a closed board. So understanding that can help you if your opponent doesn't grasp that. If you can play in cramped positions, and Aaron Nimzovich was one of the very best players uh, to be able to play in cramped positions, if you know what to do, then being cramped and closing the board off is an excellent strategy. It's not a mistake. Just be aware. Notice how they're always only just moving one move at a time or one square at a time, even the long range pieces. This will be the character. Don't get frustrated. Just practice learning how to play in close positions because this will come up. You play enough chess, you will be playing in this kind of a position. And the strategy and the tactics change 
in a close position as opposed to something that's wide open and you're slash dash sacrificing pieces and you know giving up a queen for a checkmate and all that that's not going to happen here they can't even get into each other's side yet hardly have you noticed that that's very interesting. oh no i just lost my i just lost my glasses lens i better close my eye and i'm blind no i'm not blind I will do this without my glasses, though. So he's going to rearrange his queen. And now here comes Bobby. So we saw Bobby go to here early in the game, right? Now, it, there, there's, it's not an open file. So, I mean, it is a development, yes. Later on in the game, this really doesn't serve the purpose. So he moved it back. And you say, well, what a waste of a move. No, not, not really, because now with the closed board and they realize no one's going to break through on this side. No one's going to break through on this side. Or can we? So Bobby moved his rook back over. And now that gives him the backup. See, this guy's been out here all alone. He didn't have the company of the other pawns. But with the backup piece behind him now, now that F-pawn can be extremely powerful and open up that end. And the extra bonus is the rook is on the F-file in case that does open up. If he can use a partial F-file and scoot over to the H-file or whatever you can do. So that makes sense. He moved back. Now press that pawn. Back up your pawns as you can. This is really an interesting, uh, really an interesting game for this. And, and now G will take F5. And G will take F5. Oh, no, no, no. G didn't take F5. The rook took the F5. And now we see the power of putting that rook behind the pawn. Because now he has the open file. And it's a partial file. I call it an open file because his own pawn is not blockading him in. Yes, it, he doesn't have full access to the full range, but he's got targets. So that's one of the other advantages of being on an open file. You got targets. Nice. Very nice. And that targets at the base of the pawn chain that's keeping this game closed. So that might be valuable for the future, yes? So... Knight will come to c3. Now they're going to be, again, the, the pawns are pointing toward the queen side. So now it's going to make sense for his opponent to begin shifting power there and going through somewhere, somehow. If you have to exchange some pieces in order to open up the board on this side, do it because you have the file. And, of course, Bobby can oppose him if he desires to. And it depends on how far he gets on this. If he gets going on this queen side, you're definitely going to want to oppose him. Don't just let him have the open file for free. Uh-uh. Right now, it's not a bother. But notice he is now beginning to shift the balance of power this way. Now his bishop is directly touching other minor pieces. Yeah, notice that. And... The knight is directly challenging the knight. So there could be a few exchanges based on that move here. We'll, we'll have to see. And yes, knight will take the knight. Bobby realizes, look, all we're going to do is just move back and forth, back and forth. Let's get some pieces off the board. And that makes beautiful sense. So knight to c3, knight takes c3. The bishop will take c3. And now the bishop opens up to take the bishop here. See, you always want to keep those diagonals in your radar, on your radar as you can. And now the rook will take the bishop. So the rook finally does get developed here. And now Bobby is starting to show some muscle. Very interestingly, and, and this is a kind of a really cool micro lesson as well, you guys. The rook here on the B file, as a general rule, you don't want to let your opponent have the open file for free. 
because that's the highway of power, right? Well, look who has the B file. Did Bobby fight him for the B file? No, he did not. He made it possible to double up the rooks on the F file when his opponent can't possibly double up either one of his rooks. Advantage Fisher. That's clever. That's really cool how he set that up. If you can, watch this video a few times to see that setup. The B file that White owns can be dangerous. All open files can be dangerous. As a general rule, that's why you do scrap and fight for them. But now the F file, it's not dangerous. It's deadly. It's really cool to see how Fisher set that up. That is cool. And, okay, so you've got the file. Utilize it as it's feasible, as you can. White can, so he will. This makes sense. Don't just get the file and sit there. There's not a better move, say, here. What does that do for you? It blocks off your rook from the B file for one thing. So that's not that hot of a move. Yeah, it gets the knight back up into there. Oh, and yes, hey, look, I can attack the queen if I want. No, that's not the best move. Okay, now where was this guy? Hopefully he was there. But this move is a much stronger move. You've got him on the outpost. And now here comes Fisher. And now you can see, look, Fisher has both rooks on the F file. He also has a knight over there. He also has a way to get a passed pawn. Can you see that? This is becoming very, very good for Fisher. He's very happy about this. Queen E2 getting ready to get into the action. Absolutely. Remove the blockading pawn. And now the pass pawn plays the whole pressure of the rest of this game all together. Now it's deadly for White. He has to do something. Here he comes back. He has to do something. Queen is to H2. And now Holy Nightmare Batman, or uh, Superman, Superman, yeah. That, that's not because I'm Superman. I'm super tubby, but this is me. I'm shirts. That's my name. So now, okay, so in order to carry out the attack, in order to really, really improve his position, sometimes you have to sacrifice something. Do you notice how Bobby did not continue protecting that pawn? Because that's not as important as going and making a decent attack. So he's sacrificing the pawn. He did not maintain the protection on the pawn. He's going into attack mode. And now look at this. I mean, it would have helped if he had done that in the move previous to this one. But now there he is. Now Fisher has serious, significant attacking possibilities. Now, again, the B file was used usable and used by White. He did acquire a passed pawn of his own, but it's not as close as Fisher's pawn on the H. And the F file is deadly. And now the queen and the knight is also in there. That's why Fisher's winning this game. King is going to come to B1. He's going to go, oh, crap. Queen is going to come to G2. Get just a little bit closer. Knight will come up to B4. H3. Here comes the queen. Now knight is going to take the backward D5 pawn. The rook will take the knight. Definitely. It's a sacrifice on his part. And now queen will come to C4. Fantastic pin. On the rook against the king, that's a permanent pin. So that was kind of a tricky little cool tactic. Yes, he sacrificed the knight, but now Fisher's going to lose the rook if he doesn't find a way to protect the rook. This is heads-up chess. 
Bobby simply moves the king. Now, that is a way to get out of the pin. In fact, that's probably the best way. But now he's going to lose the rook. So it's a very good exchange, except the bishop takes the f2 instead. He's not after the rook. He takes the, the f2, and the rook will take the f2. Notice the power of the f file for attack, and the b file has basically completely disappeared. However, it's disappeared with a compensation of a passed pawn, but it's so far away compared to Fisher's passed pawn. This is a wonderful game to go through again and again and again to see the effect of the closed center chessboard and how Fisher uh, opened it up and gained the advantage. This is worth watching several times for that reason. So the rook does not want to exchange. He's not in the position to exchange in case this little squirt comes through. He wants to have a rook between his king because this file is cut off from the king to escape. So the best defense at this point is bring that rook straight back. And the rook is covered with the queen. So that's, that's a good uh, defensive mood. Now at this point... Absolutely, Fisher will press the pawn. Yes, one more, and he's got the queen. So now he's got to do something. Rook takes g6. He's got to try to break through somehow. Can't quite do it. He's lost the rook for a pawn. He's going to try like crazy to sprint in. This becomes the queen. I'm going to mark it as a queen, turn the pawn upside down. I don't have an extra queen. I probably ought to make a couple of these extra queen pieces just for games like this. So the, the upside down pawn is the queen. Now the rook is protecting the king. See how that worked. And he ignores that and he goes to here. Because remember, he can't just attack because then he'll lose the second queen. Right? So he's not quite there yet. But the way through this conundrum is to go check. <laughs> Fantastic game. One move short of getting a queen, even though technically the queen wouldn't do anything for the game, the extra queen. But what a fantastic illustrated game of how the effects of having a closed board and how to work with a closed board through moving your pieces, usually your knights for the most part, because they can hop over other pieces. And in a closed board, you have a lot of cramming and lots of pieces that remain on the board. So the knights are usually the ones you rearrange the most. What a fantastic illustration of all of the principles on how to deal with a closed board game. So there's your backyard professor chess game. Thank you for watching my videos. I appreciate all your support. You guys have a wonderful day. Be happy. Do good. Be well. Make friends. Life is wonderful when you have a lot of friends to play chess with you. And I will see you soon in another backyard professor chess video. Woohoo!